Hello and welcome. I'm Bree. I'm Matt. And welcome to the Pro, the Pro Harrison, Harrison Ford, Ford but anti-Indiana Indiana Jones, Jones hate, hate club. club. And then we add, add laughter, cheers, and posts like, yeah! Whoa! Sorry. Today's episode is about something real fun that I think everyone's going to enjoy, which is the Lost City of Atlantis. Not really, but we'll get to, we'll get to the nuances later. <laughs> so of what the episode's about, or of Atlantis, both. All right, good enough. Um. So. Matt, what do you know about Atlantis? Um, well, it's run by King Neptune, and he's got a big bald patch on the top of his head, and it's and it's so bald that it makes people blind. That that's a fair assessment. Um, um the crown got lost in Shell City, and they had to go on to save the crown. The adventure they became real men. This is Spongebob reference for anyone I called you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, fun fact. Do you know uh, where the story of Atlantis traces back to? The sea? I can tell you. Actually, it was at least the first person that there is written record of speaking about Atlantis was Plato. Um, whether classic Plato, whether uh, it's most likely that it's a story that he heard kind of being like told to him. That's kind of was what's it called? Kind of like uh, what's it? I forgot the word for a specific story that's told like down through like orally. Yeah. But um, most likely it was one of those. Uh, but it also is very likely that it could have been one of Plato's, uh, like a, a part of his allegory, um, something that he made up for like the sake of telling a story or showing that, um, well. In Plato's uh, original original story, uh, Atlantis is a city that uh, gave in to hedonism and then sucked. So it was most likely Hell that yeah. <laughs> it was most likely that uh, it was just used to tell uh, to help drive the moral of the allegory. Um, of course. Uh, there might have been some people in the ancient world who thought that Atlantis might have been an actual place. Um, but by the first century, um, a lot of scholars uh, in the medieval era thought it was like uh, leading up to the medieval era at that point. They really didn't believe it was a real place. They thought it was, you know, uh, a setting in a story. Um, but as the Renaissance, approached um don't know how much you remember from florida high school system they taught me about the alamo a couple times but um so during the renaissance a lot of especially in europe um the medieval age in Europe was a significant period of stagnation. Um, there was very few improvements in art and literature. Um, most people didn't really read. Being a scholar was reserved for um, like monks and super religious folks. Um, but during the Renaissance, now the marketplace of ideas had expanded. Um, more people were interested in reading, uh, more people could read. Um, so, of course, naturally, people went back to the great classics like Plato and Atlantis had the question of if Atlantis was a real place started to become more and more prevalent. 
and when the scientific revolution followed uh, about I want to say a century I could be like off my years but um when the scientific revolution followed the renaissance uh and there had become uh, there had scholars had started to find a proof of continental drift theory of Pangea didn't exist yet they just knew like they could figure out like continental drift was a real thing um when that happened people and then during the age of uh, colonialism which kind of overlapped the scientific what's it called i scientific revolution i'm my brain's off um because it kind of overlapped um well it kind of led people to also further their um what's it called their theories uh heavy on the theories Mm -hmm. about atlantis um but um what bothers me the most about like that is like the ancient greeks were known for making up places that they were they were known for this yeah there was a lot of made up places in their uh allegories in their mythology like um hyperborea you've probably never heard of hyperborea but it's Can't very the the story of hyperborea is very similar to that of atlantis um, but instead of being like a little island, um, which Atlantis uh, in it means the island of Atlas, Hyperborea means um, beyond the north wind. So instead of it being in a little island, it was an area that was up north as far as like they could imagine. So yeah. it would be like the North Pole, even though we know now that. There was no way. We know now Hyperborea could not exist, um, especially with the way that it was described. Um, But uh, Hyperborea and Atlantis um, kind of were two of the places that, like, I feel like should have. Well, because of all the scrutiny Hyperborea got, I feel like Atlantis should have gotten some of that, uh, but it didn't. When you say scrutiny, do you mean in terms of whether or not it was real? Yes. Or in terms of, okay. Uh, there was, um, ancient Greeks did a lot for us in terms of math and science, and that is something to, like, absolutely be like enamored with um however they didn't have the the best cartographers in europe i'm sure that's a very general statement um but i'm sure a lot of people have seen that like map of the world from medieval europe yeah where it's real which uh, just... contorted yeah it's just like one oval is Europe, one oval is um, Africa, and one oval is Australia, and in the center is Jerusalem. Okay. And um, I on. I want to pull up this picture for you right now. It's just it's so funny. Mm. Um, we don't but... have a a screen view. No. Oh, okay. It's fine. We'll. We'll figure something out. Um, In post. um, But, uh... Hyperborea was... Because it was immediately, like, a lot of scholars were very... It was very easy to dismiss because where it should have been, there was... There wasn't much there. Like, aside from... um, Some people thought it might have been, like, Britain or Scandinavia or maybe Siberia but um, Hyperborea was described as like a sunny temperate beautiful land that was lush and you weren't gonna get that 
the northernmost part of where um, Greece is today. Very, very cold. Uh, yeah. Um, and both Hyperborea and Atlantis had this very utopian kind of like ideal to them. How were they utopias if they were so swathed with sin that they were struck to the sea? See, that is a very good question because the utopia part of it was mostly about how people could live their lives as in like they were free from political squabbles um their the systems that were in place to hold their society like agriculture transportation things like that were all like well working they had it figured out they were so smart um but the idea behind those al- the allegory of Atlantis at least is because people had all of this handed to them um it was kind of they had it too easy so they could let their hedonism take over a lot more easily uh, are you telling me that Atlantis is a uh strong men create good times create weak men create bad times kind of is that what you're telling me Atlantis is? Because you're ruining Atlantis, if that's what you're saying, Atlantis is. I'm going to ruin Atlantis more uh, for you. Next, you're going to tell me King Neptune's not bald. Go on. No, King Neptune's bald. You don't got to worry about Thank that. God. Thank God. At least some things are sacred. I can't hear you. Don't worry about it. What'd you say? You can't be on the ferries. It's on camera. Don't worry. Don't worry about it's... it. Mm. Uh, but I, if you don't mind, do you have any questions or concerns about both Hyperborea or Atlantis? Is there a reason why they were... T- it sounds like they're telling the same story, so why were they two different places? I didn't, like... Didn't drown into the sea or anything hyperborea was just it just served as like a literary tool that kind of represented like exoticness and like otherness and something to like obtain versus atlantis being like we could have obtained that um but if we did obtain too much of a good thing it would have led to a problem but too much public transport all right centrists Sorry, you want to know what's what's <laughs> you want to know what's really funny about that? I, I don't, I didn't mention this before, but um, Atlantis was described as being an island, like several, like islands that were like concentric rings, like the Target logo. Okay. That were connected. Man, that branding goes deep. <laughs> it's the Starbucks siren all over again. <laughs> But I want to shift the topic a little Mm -hmm. over to something else. (gasps) I would like to shift our location from ancient Greece to Edwardian Russia. Edwardian? Is that a time period or is that a time period? Okay, yeah, I figured. Um, so is this still? Does this have? Is this still Atlantis? We'll get back to Atlantis. Don't you worry. Okay. All right, we're gonna put Atlantis down. <laughs> now I am on the edge of my seat. So, in the late eighteen hundreds, uh. A woman known as Helena Petronova Blavatsky was born in Russia. Mm-hmm. She was born to an aristocratic family. Um, and she had eventually moved to um, New York and then Philadelphia from Russia. She had spent... Okay because her family could afford to. Um, It is said that her family sent her traveling all over Russia, all over Europe, 
all over Asia, and then eventually she chose to settle in the Northeast of the U.S. Um, put a pin in that. Um, so, because of her travels, um, Madam Edwardian, well, Edwardian, give me a year. What? I give can, me a time range. Give me. In it, one second, I'll give you the exact year. Um, Look at her go. 1890 to 1910. All right. 30 years. Cool. Um, I don't think that works. So, cool. I'm going to pretend I didn't say that. Go on. <laughs> I can so, do math. Go on. So proud of you. Uh, because of her travels, um, at least take everything I'm saying with the the biggest salt lamp you can find. Um, because I'm not gonna lick it. I'm not gonna lick it. I'm sorry. We can edit. I didn't I'm even. So I didn't even notice it was there. <laughs> you told me to put it in the shot. I did not. A likely story. Anyways, go on. Take that with your salt lamp. Um, during her time in New York and Philadelphia, she got um, heavily involved in the New Age spiritual movement oh, no. of that time. Oh, have there always been like Herbalife people out there? Is your herbalife she was getting involved in. She was she was selling actual snake oil. Like this is before people knew. Uh, okay. All right. So she got involved in an MLM in 1890. Okay, you're you're okay. I just oh sorry I. Okay. I'm so sorry. I just my ah, uh, it just uh, physically hurts me having to continue on with the story because it makes me so uncomfortable. Um, what did Herbalife do? <laughs> Madame Blavatsky. Um, so she founded the Theosophical Society, which was basically her starting her cult. Um, as most people who are heavily involved in New Age spirituality end up doing. Um, and if they usually acquire like a group of like-minded friends or followers, you know, you start a society. Um, and due to her travels to Asia, which Honestly and truly, some people speculate if she ever actually went to Asia. Um, because there was no, like, aside from her saying it, there was no, there was not ever any, like, proof of it. Um, she, she never really, like, she only ever brought it up if it was tied to like her trying to use it as like what's it called like a like legit justification justification or to help legitimize her her move her movement um but she based a lot of her beliefs on appropriated hindu belief um so it is the same as today's new age religion yeah. 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 Okay. Um, but she also crazy how history is doing repeat itself. Sorry, go on. Um, but also like other New Age uh, beliefs, she also stole concepts from ancient Greece, especially Neo Platoism. Neo what? Neo Platoism. I heard you. I've not heard of that one before. What are the new Plato kids on the block talking about? 
that's a whole other podcast in itself. Listen. All right. Um, they sound like a concerning group, but go on. Yeah. Um, Nine. Okay. She, much like most, again, much like most people who are associated with New Age spirituality, she, you, she, um, how do we say it? She mm-hmm. tried to show off um, her how spiritual she was by um, inducing paranormal phenomenon that turned out to be fake. Yeah. So she would say, look, I'm for sure legitimate. Let me put some ghosts in your life because you don't believe in it. And then she would just take credit whenever something bad would happen to that person. Not necessarily something bad, but like, have you ever watched any like historical fiction shows that are like trying to be historically accurate? Sure, I'm sure. Um, that's a very not... common. Sorry. I was just gonna say you're not gonna get me to watch the Three Musketeers. First of all, it's just called The Musketeers. And second of all, that's way too late in the timeline for what I'm trying to like refer to. Uh, uh shows that usually like talk about like like post regency era but like up to the victorian era they usually have this fun little thing where people get together in someone's house and host the seance cuz that's fun mm-hmm. and um i'm guessing like that was just a thing people did um mm-hmm. and so i'm guessing that like she did one of those parties and would like fake there being a ghost in the room or fake like like you know, like like the mediums and stuff. Um, I'm guessing she pulled a couple of those. Uh, and she used it to build a cult. Yeah. How gullible were people back then? Did you just like do the Ouija board and you're clearly moving? And they're like, oh. I don't think everyone was that gullible. Her work was. It was influential. I cannot deny that. However, um, being influential and being both popular are not necessarily always the same thing or intertwined. Um, In what circles was she influential? The New Age movement, especially. Okay, so, all right. Um, But a lot of, again, like the New Age movement sometimes is usually like very fringe for some people. Um, It's something that you actively have to seek out sometimes, especially during this era where there was no internet. Like, like there was no algorithms that just kind of figured out that you would like this if it kept showing you it. Um, Like you had to seek this out and a lot of people were very happy not seeking it out. uh sorry i was just reading a line like i just my eyes cut a line in her biography where like her followers called her a sage but everyone else called her a charlatan um but the most important Mm -hmm. most influential thing in my opinion that madame blavatsky did was publish a book called the secret doctrine I don't like where this is going. It's gonna get worse from here. Um, okay. So, I know in my personal experience, I've seen a lot of New Age folks still recommend the Secret Doctrine, even though they don't fully believe in it. They'll say like, "Hey, disclaimer: I don't believe in this book, but if you want to get into like paganism." or wicca 
or some type of like esoteric like group you gotta mm-hmm. read it first absolutely not absolutely not why would you start someone off with a book that if you can't find one book that you can even agree with about i mean uh, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about New Age people. Go on. New Age spirituality folks. Um, it's... And also, maybe if you have to rely on pseudoscience that doesn't have a lot of backing, maybe you should, like, double-check that. And I say this as someone who, who considers myself fairly religious. Still... Like, you can understand that your spiritual beliefs are one thing, but you have to be able to understand, like, you don't have to, like, mix it with pseudoscience to legitimize how you feel. Um, But also, you cannot deny certain realities, because... It's not even certain realities, and you cannot deny reality. Um, But um, but back to her book, The Secret Doctrine, I'm guessing... Secret secret Doctrine or Secret Doctor? Doctrine. Doctrine. Okay, the first time I heard Secret Doctor, sorry. Oh. Oh. Um, So, the book is... Uh, is about basically it's her lining out her beliefs basically it's a, her bible onto her people um, and of course the first half where she talks about like very basic beliefs like the origin of the universe things like um, how things it's... came to be like the very like like her genesis is basically copy pasted from Hindu um ideology, Hindu religion. Oh, that's fun. She didn't even like hide that she was copying the homework. Yeah. But here's where it gets messed up. Even it's gonna be more uncomfortable than that. <sighs> okay. I this is the part of the book where um so a lot of people in New Age spirituality, when they were, when they, especially in the modern day, when they tell you to read this, they're hoping that you read the first part that's basically copy-pasted Hindu belief. Um, except they don't want to hear it from a Hindu person, so it's easier to just give you a, a book like that, that sums it up perfectly. It, sums it, up, it doesn't even sum it up perfectly. Um, it it just, sums up the points that it wanted to take. It sums, yeah, it sums up the point that's most easy for someone who is, who has been exposed to a um, Christian worldview. It makes the, that's what's easy to digest and understand from Hinduism, and that's what you read. That's the first part. The second half, some people still, a lot of people when they recommend this book, they don't want, care about the second half. They don't believe in it, but. There are people who use this to base off other beliefs. Um, Were you uh, ever exposed to like the star seed craze on TikTok when it came up like in 2020? Your confusion, your confusion is very relieving. Um, So. The second half of The Secret Doctrine is about uh, Lady Blavatsky going over the five root races of human beings. What? The what? Okay. How do we get here from Atlantis? Okay, I'm sorry. We're getting uh, back to Atlantis. I know. I know you're going to do a fun little tie-in, but right now it's comfortable. Go on. Um, Tell me about the crazy white lady. What's real fun is that uh, it's a great thing I brought up Hyperborea, too, um, because two of the original root races are Atlanteans and Hyperboreans. Oh, so she's just pulling shit from all over. 
Oh, say, so, okay, I get it. Now, so this is where, like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this is where in the timeline of Atlantis discourse, it went away from, like, oh, I wonder if this lost city is real to, like, oh, I bet Atlantis is where they keep the secret government files so prove the moon's fake or whatever like what like the weird conspiracy stuff it is now like this is the first step to that is what you're saying listen if people believe that i i have chosen to not look into that because i don't i want to i want to believe there's good in people i want to believe there's good in the world Mm -hmm. so this is this will get worse um but this that's as worse as i will allow it to become for me okay all right um it's a wise decision her belief uh in her book she goes to outline that atlanteans were the original aryan race and that's That's not okay all right okay um Ah. so her work really like it really kicked off um late 1800s early 1900s right Hmm. um and okay Um, check the notes check the notes i am the notes are are deeply uncomfortable um oh in 1920s 1930s germany Mm-hmm. Uh, there was another sharp turn another sharp turn I gotta say go on there was a belief mm. system called Ariosophy Ariosophy I feel like I'm pronouncing it wrong um, mm-hmm. but it's also called Arianism how the feeling um It. You can see that. You can edit that out in post. It's fine. It was. Uh, a much like Madame Blavatsky's combining like random beliefs from different. Uh, things, um, when Arianism was being developed, it was developed very, very loosely on um, German paganism, very, very loosely um, on Christianity. But the most influential um, ideology that like really pushed away was the Asafi, which is what Madame, the, the school of spirituality, the society of spirituality that Madame Blavatsky started. So you're telling me that as opposed to you're telling me that TikTok New Age spirituality created Nazism in a long roundabout way? Not TikTok, the like eighteen yeah, hundreds version of it. Yeah. Ye old TikTok spirituality. Um yes. And... Oh, okay, man. sorry. We can we can get back to modern day parallels in a second because I mm-hmm. promise you there is. Mm-hmm. Um, but what made this? Well, I don't need to explain this anymore because you made the connection yourself. Um, these folks were very interesting because the the little bit of German paganism that leaked in was runes, and that's where they got a lot of their symbolism from Germanic runes. Uh... Oh, they don't ever. St- okay, yeah. Um, Sorry, I'm just connecting dots. And, not out loud, which is not great for podcasts. So sorry. And it's very important to mm-hmm. me, at least, to acknowledge um, several things here. Mm-hmm. Um. The use of ancient Greek mythology in 
this specific movement mm -hmm. was not accidental. Um, the use of yeah. and the bastardization of historical uh, religions, especially European historical religions, while mm -hmm. like openly crediting European historical religions and not crediting the uh, uh, the non-European ones is very the much, brown ones, yeah, is very much not on uh, very much on purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, I assume it in some way, shape, or form times it ties into that whole, uh, you know, I'm not going to say everyone that, uh, not everyone that loves ancient Greece is a racist, however, comma, all racists love ancient Greece because it's where the white people were great and doing their thing and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it comes from um, a very, very horrendous an awful understanding of history um, and just one thing that like has been important to me that I, I'm pretty sure I've mentioned this before to you like when you go in through a history when you go in through into anthropology you have to understand you cannot view ancient people through a lens of idea like uh, you can't worship them you cannot look down on them. You have to remember they were people and they are they're dead. You can't get mad at them for the shitty things they did cuz now they're they're dead. They can't do anything bad anymore. Um that's not to say like obviously you can't be mad at certain figures within the last like 100 years cuz those actions still very much affect us today. Um but like if you look at certain societies as a whole and you decide to like say they were awful because X, Y, and Z. Like, you can't just say you hate ancient Sparta because they, like, fight. Like, but you also mm. still can't put Sparta or Athens on a pedestal because, like, they really knew what being a man was in Sparta or, like, they really knew what being an intellectual was in Athens because that's not true. <laughs> they were people. And to turn people into something that is to further your own ideology is a way that we consistently look at history that is bad for us because um this like exoticism of this othering of people from other places also can like happen to people from other times and if we don't look at people as people, we are doing both them and us a disservice. Uh, but to trace this back to Atlantis, um, it is actually to trace this back to the secret doctrine and to, because I said I want to talk more about um, modern day parallels, uh, it is very easy to go from the like very spiritual hippie new age like trying to figure out like trying to understand concepts like karma or trying to like connect with nature it's very easy to go from that there is a pipeline from that to like straight up white supremacy and it is something that is very easy to fall into we um, see it with a lot of the greatest generation folk. Those that are like, and all like the hippies from the 70s, like not all of them, obviously, but like a lot of them came back from Woodstock, like, you know, like I saw a black guy. And you're like, whoa, grandma. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's like the most telling sign of it. But um, what's really fun about being an internet kid is I got to see this happen on Tumblr in the early 2010s and I also got to see this happen again on TikTok in during the pandemic. Love um, being a historian of the internet. Uh, <laughs> these are holes that people fall into because of 
it's very easy to be skeptical, but it's very hard to learn how to actually be media literate. Um, so, but also like, we already are set up to kind of categorize people in our heads, um, even if it's just like good or bad. Um, the if you are around rhetoric that you're not aware is racist that maybe like you haven't experienced life outside of like a white christian household of course um other types of spirituality are going to entrance you because you've never had the opportunity to learn what's out there but also if you've never had the opportunity to know what's out there you won't understand how to engage with certain topics with tact and it's very easy that like instead of going down that rabbit hole from like a piece of like hatred from a place of hatred or, or just anger it's very easy to fall into that hole from a place of like love and wanting like acceptance and equality and, and compassion um they're both sides of the same coin which is just being ignorant um because I'm sure that reading The Secret Doctrine or something when I was like 13 or like 12 might have entranced me because I was a child and I hadn't developed my brain enough to understand that uh, this is one person's take on something that doesn't mean that it has to be my take because I think that it's well written or something. Um, but a lot of people don't actively engage with ideas in a way that they can go, I want to accept this, and I don't want to accept this. They don't, they just find something that they think is smarter or cooler or whatever the case may be and go, I want to internalize that now. And that can be very harmful when it comes to spirituality, especially um, anything based on the backs of myth, whether it be a uh, urban myth or uh, ancient Greek myth. Mm. Uh, take everything with even like <laughs> scholars within the same field will take everything their colleagues are saying with a grain of salt. Uh, so, sorry, that, that was my piece, two mm -hmm. cents on that, yeah. I mean, it's fair. It's, uh, I'm not sure if it's getting worse, but media literacy in this country has been a problem for eons. Um, I'm sorry, I just wanted to make that joke about how uh, Trump had laws because he got the revo uh the recount and rick to ron DeSantis. why well, do that every time uh ron DeSantis is like i know how to fix this and so he just stopped teaching us math um now we can't recount him um sorry have you not heard that one sorry that was off topic um i don't uh... that was that was kind of funny Thank you. I didn't come up with it. It hurts um, so much being someone who's in higher education. It's funny. It hurts being in Florida, um, regardless. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's something that I've I've seen with most of the um, I don't want to say adults because that's I mean we're technically one of those, but um, you know, like thirty five plus. Uh, people that I speak to, a lot of the time it's like, well, I, I heard this one time on, on this one station, so it's fact. I'm like, okay, well, do you like look into it at all or do you think about it you know, a little bit and compare it to like previous experiences or stories that you've heard about? I'm like, no, not really. This is just what they told me. I'm like, okay, well, here's conflicting evidence. And they're like, I don't know if that evidence is acceptable. I'm like, why? They're like, because it makes me uncomfortable. I'm like, okay, well, that's not how that works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know.
Um, media literacy has always been a problem. And in terms of um, cults and, and religion, uh, people that have a difficult time um, cutting uh, a, a statement, a text or whatever into statements and yes or knowing like each one, do I agree with this? Uh, people just kind of accept something as a whole and then don't even like realize what that whole thing entails. Um, you find that with a lot of like real racist Christians, uh, not to just be shit, uh, pooping on Christians, gotta keep his PG. Um, we're so far away from that. Yeah, I said shit. Um, anyways, I said shit, uh, pooping. Sorry. Uh, not to be just, uh, degraded Christians, but, um, you know, we're in America. It's, it's a word. Um, but like, you'll, you'll see that with a lot of like real racist Christians where it's like, I don't think you know anything that this book is talking about. Like, did you read it? And they're like, of course I read it. They said the, the gays are bad. I'm like, you didn't read it. You didn't read the book. You didn't read it. I know you didn't read it. Um, Cause you could. I mean, we can talk about that if we ever want to do this again. I can talk mm. about ancient Mesopotamian sexuality for years. That is not even a joke. Uh, I'm sure. That could be uh, the whole podcast. Can please. Um, I We have hit 45 minutes, so I kind of want to <sighs> wrap this up. Oh, so, snap. Any last questions or words or anything that you have that you'd like? I don't. To? I don't like that this. You told me to do a podcast with you about Atlantis, and all I've heard about is Nazis and, and crazy white women. And I'm upset. I'm we can, ticked off, man. We can watch Atlantis 2001, the Disney that, movie. That would that would make me feel better. That would make me feel better. I'm uh, going to tell you about. Ignatius Donnelly. I don't know what you're talking about. Movie. Um, sorry, Ignatius Donnelly was. Sorry, gotta like backtrack a little. Um, mm -hmm. When uh, the Mayan Empire was discovered by colonialists, um, they thought that these people must be the Atlanteans. Because they, they're Why? like, they were like checking off the boxes. They weren't even <laughs> checking off the boxes. There was no concentric circles. But every time Colonius came to this part of the world, they just picked a name out of a hat. Like, you're the Indians. And you're, uh, you're Atlanteans, and uh, uh, you can be, you can be, uh, you know, the Steves. Sure, you're the Steves. Like, they you just names, pick names out of that. They mm -hmm. did that because. They had a very Christian creationist worldview, and they didn't want to consider that their own religion, their own story of how the universe came to be, um, could be questioned. So that's part of why they did that, um, because these people could have been here the whole time. They weren't in the Bible, but... Atlantis wasn't in the Bible either, but I guess because it was a Greek story, it gave it more legitimacy. Mm. Um, so what about India? Why did they think? I mean, I know he thought he was. I, whatever. It's the whole like Native Americans are Indians thing. It's just is just so stupid. I don't know how that survived three hundred years. I really don't. I don't. <laughs> Indigenous Americans don't even appreciate being called Indian. That's my point. I said, like, natives don't... I, that's what I'm saying. I don't know how that that naming convention stuck around. It should have been like, I'm at India. And they're like, no. And he's like, I'm not in India? And they would have been like, no. And then he should have stopped calling them Indians. But Communicate, and by the time they figured it out, they were like, Oh, well, they're all brown, they don't but care. That's, that's my point is like, I know it must have taken a while to establish effective communication. How long did it take for you to just be like, You're Indians now? That's not. I also feel like part of it has been because of throughout um, 
history. Um, a lot of, I'm going to be honest, I don't think a lot of Europeans probably ever considered, considered um, Indigenous Americans at all. I, like after the colonial era maybe like they they just didn't have a reason to I couldn't imagine them finding a reason to care about indigenous Americans um but Americans white Americans who did write about them kind of kept using it as like a derogatory way to just refer to like them because they you know they're all brown they're all walking around with so little modesty that like it was kind of another like way to keep putting indigenous Americans down. Am I surprised? No. Um, mm. But also, just... it could have totally also been just a microaggression that they didn't realize or recognize or like care to consider that they were doing. I'm just saying, after 300 years, someone should have been like, they're not. And then stop, but I don't know. It's not like, it's not like we're not in America. Um, so not. Um, but, uh, my goodness, why can I remember? I remember the date off the top of my head before this, but uh, Ignatius Donnelly, the guy who I will not shut up about when we watch Atlantis 2001, who is the direct reason Atlantis 2001 has some of the plot points that it does. So um, does, it, does the Atlantis 2001 movie talk make it to the podcast, or is this, is this for the patrons or the Patreon? No. We can do it for I the Patreon. Do Fresh head. Ah, uh, well, uh, uh, we're not right. sponsored uh, by HelloFresh. We could be. We could be. Hello, HelloFresh. Uh, uh, NordVPN. Um, no, I know more. I'm just gonna say what I, my piece about Ignatius Donnelly real quick, and then we can wrap up. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I'll do a NordVPN ad. God. Ignatius mm -hmm. Donnelly was the governor of Minnesota at some point, and he wrote a whole book about how he thought um, the ancient Mayan, well, the Mayans were um, Atlanteans. And he was, he did it in like a way that like made logical sense, but it didn't make any like scientific sense. Made logical sense. Like, he was connecting dots, but, like... He was connecting dots the way QAnon forums do, where they're like, did you know that JFK had a blue handkerchief on March 13th, and then here on March 14th, he's got a yellow hang... I don't know. <laughs> it's, like, it, it, it sounds like it's the same kind of conspiracy jargon that's um, so I... effervescent in politics today. I respect Ignatius a little bit more because he was a little bit less racist with it. And that's... Oh, well, what a doll. You know, that's all you can really ask for yeah. in, what, 1983? Not that long ago. It was um, longer than that. Um, it was okay. way longer than that. Um, okay. He was like 17, 1800s. Um, okay, I'm sorry. You said that he was directly involved in the making of 2008's Atlantis. Oh, I mean, like, his writings about the Mayans and okay, Atlanteans right, have okay. a direct effect on this movie. I'm sorry, does the Disney 2008 Atlantis suggest that... 2001 Atlantis um, suggest that Atlanteans are Mayans? A little. Oh, okay. All right, okay. That's why all the Mayans... I haven't watched it either, but I have seen clips, and I know way too much about the movie. Like, you, if I start talking about it, about it, people would be surprised that I haven't watched it because of how mm -hmm. much I know about it. But um, I feel like I sh I sh it's 
I just did a whole project on Atlantis. I should have watched it. <laughs> Feels like a waste. Yeah. Um, I tried dressing. That's what up. this podcast could have been about. I'm sorry. Go on. Okay, next we're doing this again next week. That's what next week's podcast is going to be about, and then the week after we'll talk about Mesopotamian sex. Thank but you. Those are for the patrons. So if you're her professor and you want more episodes of this, either give me a crisp five dollar bill or her an A. That's all you got to do. Uh, find us on Spotify, Pandora, Apple Music. Bandcamp, SoundCloud, I... Radio Lab, the radio, Carrier Pigeon, uh, Red Box Mail In Service, mm, illegally downloaded MP3 from your friend's laptop. That's all of them. Sorry. I'm so sorry, Dr. Z or Carla, <laughs> whoever has to grade this and sit through an hour of us yeah um thank you for listening i hope you got to put this on in the background while you did other things and i hope you you did dishes to this have a good summer Donde está la biblioteca? End the episode. End the end.